Hello, my name is Stephanie Lemick. I am so excited to get kicked off on this week's panel for Trauma-Informed Workplace Principles, sponsored by the Wounded Workforce. My name is Stephanie Lemick. I'm a former HR executive and the founder of the Wounded Workforce, where we're all about building trauma-informed workplaces. Today, we are going to have an amazing conversation about collaboration as a principle of trauma-informed workplaces. And before we dive too deep into that, I would love to go ahead and start by introducing my panelists today. So I'll go ahead and have each one of our panelists introduce themselves, and we'll start with you, Taylor. Great. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Taylor Ward, and I am the Director of Organizational Effectiveness and Engagement at Pulte Group. Uh, I have over 10 years of HR experience, um, mainly with large corporations. I was at Coca-Cola prior to Pulte, um, but started off in event planning and executive education, actually at Emory University. And that's what really kind of ignited my passion in the HR space was all around talent management and bringing people together to be their best selves. So I'm really excited to talk about the collaboration topic. Amazing. Thanks, Taylor. And I have to, I have to have a plug. Taylor is my forever <laughs> best friend at work. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> she is my favorite example of how you can build relationships in a remote environment because Taylor and I have never actually lived or worked in the same location um, through the entire time we've been friends seven, and co-workers. Seven years. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, ex so excited to have Taylor here um, and uh, get to chat again, uh, many chats we've had. Anessa, go ahead and go next. Yes, so I'm Anessa Fike. I have been in the HR people and talent space for almost 15 years, which really dates me. Um, <laughs> uh, the gray hair is natural, by the way, but I had it early <laughs> on in life. Um, I own Fike & Co., which is a um, boutique firm uh, focusing around fractional people leadership and talent leadership. But we also work across um, projects. We work as advisors. Um, we also just, you know, really kind of love everything and every anything and everything that is HR and people and talent. So we have worked with um, over 110 companies around the globe and, you know, lots of which are probably apps on your phone. Um, but I just love this space. And I find that the best places to work, as Stephanie and Taylor mentioned, are places that get collaboration right so I'm really excited to be here today. And just like human side of me, I'm a mom, I'm a wife. Um, I am a uh, really, really, really like DEI, heavy DEIJ advocate. Um, and hopefully I can be described as an ally. So that is what the fire inside of me also pushes me to do in this world. Amazing. So grateful to have you here, Anessa. And if you're not following Anessa on LinkedIn, you better get on it because she has <laughs> the best takes on Thank HR, you. DEI, just about everything. Um, so, so make sure and follow her if you aren't already, which you probably are. And last but certainly not least, Nicole would love to have you introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm so excited to be part of this panel with you all. And uh, it's such a great topic. Uh, so my background, I am an attorney and I have been in the tech industry for over 25 years. So also dating myself. <laughs> um, and where I come into this conversation is I have led teams in organizations, large, small, and everything in between. I um, wrote a book and pu it's published. It's out there in the world, Enhance Employee Engagement, Future-Proof Company Strategies. And it's all about collaboration and how we get people working well together. Um, so currently I have my own business and it is focused on personal and professional development. This has been a, um, a passion in my life for the past 15 years. I've gone deep in the personal development industry and I am now bringing it into um, the corporate world because I see that it's everything works better. Collaboration happens when, mm -hmm. as Taylor said, people are being their best selves. 
And um, so my company helps people be their best selves, both professionally and personally. And I, um, I myself on the personal side, I'm a single mother and um, I'm just super excited to be part of this conversation. We're so excited to have you, Nicole. We love it. HR people love it when someone who isn't an HR person is excited yeah. about HR stuff. Yeah. It's like, woohoo, someone I'm gets it. With HR people, right? Like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, someone listened. Oh my goodness. Oh, gosh. Um, so, so thrilled to have such an amazing group together today. Before we get kicked off into our questions, I always love to provide a little bit of context since we're talking about collaboration as a principle of trauma-informed workplaces. So we know that effective collaboration is a non-negotiable in today's workplace. Being able to work well with others to achieve a goal is central to everyone's role in an organization. However, effective collaboration so often eludes organizations and teams, and more often than not, it actually comes down to design. An imbalance of power is inherent to the traditional organizational design that most organizations follow, and it's a typical hierarchic hierarchical structure. Power dynamics out of balance work against effective collaboration. So today, we're going to be talking about collaboration as a principle of trauma-informed workplaces. So we're going to think about how can we build a more collaborative environment, but we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the things that get in the way, like positional power and power imbalances and challenges as it relates to organizational structure as well. Because of the wounded workforce, yes, we talk about what individuals can do, but we're not afraid to recognize that systems and structures a lot of times get in the way of what we're trying to do as well. So we have to do both. So super excited to dive in and have this conversation. And I would love to kick it off with the first question, which is why is collaboration such an important key to a productive trauma-informed workplace culture? And anyone who wants to dive in, go ahead and just unmute yourself and jump in with your thoughts. I can start us off. So, oh gosh, why is it so important? I think I think we have probably all seen, and hopefully everyone who is tuning in, Stephanie has probably experienced this too, of being in an organization with silos, right? And being in an organization where people hoard information and don't talk to each other and really don't collaborate at all or even effectively, right? And to me, it's a lot of the time when I'm looking at something in, in, in the workplace specifically and designing that, some of the best things come out of what you don't want to be. And so the opposite of collaboration for me is having a siloed organization. And a siloed organization is such a weird spot where everyone feels like they're walking on eggshells, but they don't know what they don't know. And they're probably duplicating efforts because they don't know what another team is working on. And so there's a lot of just these little kind of spirals, chaotic spirals going on, right? And that's the opposite of what we all want in a workplace. It's also the opposite of moving any kind of mission or um, business, you know, perspective forward. So for me, as thinking about why is it such an amazing and a needed principle for a trauma-informed workplace, is it's essential because without it, you have silos. And without the collaboration, you may be able to take five steps forward, but then you will absolutely take 10 steps back. And so mm -hmm. I think for any progress, for any organization, collaboration is so needed because in what we all typically do, unless you're a manufacturing organization or an agriculture business or something that requires you to do work in a specific place, a lot of the organizations in today's world are knowledge-based organizations. And so that knowledge basis comes from people around you, different perspectives, different ideals, different backgrounds, different thoughts, different ways of coming towards a problem. And that to me is what makes a trauma informed workplace such a wonderful aspect to have all of those elements. Because if you don't ask and you don't know and you don't talk and you don't collaborate, you don't know any of those aspects. 
So for me, it's kind of like moving forward and progressing in any business, in any workplace has collaboration as a requirement because without it, we're going backwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely, I mean, collaboration without it, you have waste for the mm-hmm. reasons that you just talked about, because there is not only duplication of efforts, but duplication of tools, right? How many times mm-hmm. have we seen, oh, the engineering group has this tool to do this thing, but this other group needs to do the same thing, but with their own tool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and then that actually further impedes their ability to collaborate with each other because they're on their own tools with their information and everything. They can't share it with the other group that's on a different tool. Um, so yes, I will say too, though, that, um, just like, I think some of us have probably heard that you can't be angry and grateful at the same time. I don't think that you can have collaboration and trigger trauma at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when we're collaborating, we're actually maybe even, you know, kind of, healing some past trauma, particularly workplace trauma, because part of collaboration is that agency, right? When we're collaborating, everybody that's collaborating with each other has some self-determination. They have some say, they're contributing, they're being listened to, and they're listening to others. All of those things are not going to create trauma at a minimum. They're not going to create trauma Um, and they'll, and they'll prevent it and possibly even heal it. So I feel like for that reason, collaboration is so key for trauma informed workplaces. Yeah. And I would just add to that. I think when I looked at it, when you think of collaboration, it's really those relationships that you build. And there's so, as Stephanie brought up, we're best friends at work. We still collaborate, even though we're in different in different roles and different places. But I really think, you know, when Gallup has done so much research on having a best friend at work, but when you think about how strong relationships, they bring you energy, they bring you joy, they give you support and growth. And Nicole, as you were saying, when you think about collaboration, there can't be trauma. Um, maybe we can dissect that a little bit more because I think collaboration can can take a turn sometimes if it's not done effectively where there might be a trigger or trauma that you don't know about. But at the core of it, it is building those relationships. So how do we work better together? How do we open up dialogue, create listening channels, understand our power, understand our our you know, impact of others, that all comes from that, that relationship building and that trust and open communication, um, brainstorming ideas, innovation that can come from uh, collaboration processes. Oh, I love that. Such an amazing, amazing answer <laughs> to the first question, which is always great. So when you think about collaboration, especially effective collaboration at work, what do you think is the biggest challenge, you know, individuals or organizations face when it comes to creating effective collaboration? I mean, I can start, I think, and and I didn't mention this earlier in my intro, but I've, in my role now, I lead a lot of projects, um, big enterprise-wide projects from implementing an HCM Um, to talent management, core people processes. And with that, there is a lot of collaboration if you want it to be effective and have stakeholder management. I think when I've looked back at projects I've been a part of um, or change management initiatives that I've been a part of where maybe I've seen a challenge, I've experienced it or from leading it, I think it comes down to a few things. So one is people are involved. And I I don't want to misquote, I probably should have written down, but there's this quote that's always stuck with me from Patrick Lencioni about how teams are made up of people and people are inherently dysfunctional. And so you have to be able to manage that. And when you think of trauma, it's what everyone brings to work, right? Stephanie, you always talk about that, that backpack, but that shows up in how you're managing projects. And so what does that turn into? You have to have trust understand people's triggers, understand people's stresses, Um, all the research we have around burnout um, and loneliness, all of that can show up when you are collaborating and managing 
people from different levels, different parts of the organization. So I think those are some clear challenges. Um, being sure to create a safe and open dialogue and having the right people in that team who know how to foster um, and create openness. If you have someone um, who might trigger a lot of people, you're going to have a lot of people who who shut down and don't feel safe um, or that they're able to be themselves. Um, so, Nicole, that's what I kind of said. Maybe we can explore that more because if you don't have the right person um, creating that effective collaboration, it actually can bring out uh, some some traumas or some triggers. I've seen people shut down in meetings and being having that if you have a leader involved who doesn't have self-awareness uh, to understand and read the room and how do we bring everyone together. I think those are some of the, the biggest challenges I've seen. Um, I'll stop there so that I can share, but those, I just, yeah, made I, I, will, <laughs> I will say, I should have qualified. I should have said true collaboration, yeah, because true. We're calling effective tr collaboration. I consider it true collaboration. Like it's not collaborative in my, con in my thinking mm -hmm. when, you know, somebody is shutting people down yeah. because they are not self-aware because they're bullying because, right. you know, there's a lot, right, that people do, but that's when they're doing those things, they're not actually collaborating. Really? <laughs> so working with other people, yeah. that's a big distinction between working together, working together, right, working with others and actually collaborating with them, two different things. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm so glad that you, you know, parse that out because it's very important, um, I think, for everyone to understand that working together is doesn't equal collaboration. Mm -hmm. There really is a difference. Um, and, you know, I so being a lawyer in an organization, you know, we're one of those groups that works across functions, just like HR works across yeah. functions, the lawyers work across functions. And what I have um, experienced is that oftentimes, you know, myself and others on my other lawyers on my team, we're often bringing different people and different functions together to get them talking in, you know, in a way that they wouldn't normally because we just have such a cross-functional role in organizations and we need to bring people together to do, you know, what we're tasked to do within an organization. And so um, what I find is that what gets in the way of true collaboration is lack of communication and lack of trust. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, the two, and again, you know, there's, there's effective communication and then there's destructive mm -hmm. communication, right? But I'm, you know, when people are communicating well and often and in appropriate ways, um, you know, with appropriate transparency, it tends to build trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Like when you have effective communication, it tends to build trust. And so the two, it's like two sides of the same coin. But I feel like these are critical um, in order to have collaboration. You need to have that good communication and you need to build trust. And there are lots of ways to build trust. Absolutely. And I would say, too, to the biggest challenge, right? And, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, but I think the biggest challenge to collaboration is sometimes one of the biggest challenges in a workplace overall, um, which is the lack of self-awareness, the lack of ability to take feedback, absorb mm -hmm. it, the lack of hearing feedback, right? Being in a space to hear feedback. Um, and coupled with that, I would say the other piece is managing expectations, which is a little bit of what Taylor and Nicole, you mentioned as well, just around a lot of, you know, a lot of kind of um, pieces that everyone in a workplace can be upset about or unsure about comes because, you know, comes around because there's a sort of a misalignment of expectations. And so, Taylor, to your point of having the right person to really spur that conversation, to really spur that collaboration, 
is essential. And then the call to your piece around uh, self-awareness and all of that as well as with you, with having self-aware leaders that are able to hear, actively hear, right? And take feedback and then also work with each other to create a safe space and a trusting space where people feel okay to be themselves and okay to disagree, right? Mm -hmm. Because true collaboration, mm -hmm. that's kind of a third challenge is some people see collaboration as just agreeing with each other, yes, ending the conversation, right? As we learn in improv, but sometimes collaboration means disagreeing or thinking about things from the opposite perspective. So for me, some of the challenges, self-awareness, feedback or lack of, you know, the ability to take feedback and then that third piece as well. So, yeah. Oh, Vanessa, you got to something that I'm so excited <laughs> to talk about. Anyone who's ever worked with me is going to like roll their eyes as I say this, because like my favorite thing to talk about is positional power and how no one understands, look, Taylor's laughing at me, no one understands their positional power and how mm -hmm. often that comes into play and things going really wrong. Yeah. So I would love to hear from this group, you know, what do you see go wrong with power dynamics in the workplace most often? So much to say here. <laughs> um, I, one of the things I see go wrong is um, I, I see leaders having this misconception that leadership means they have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a leader that has that misconception, it shuts everything down. It shuts down the collaboration. It amps up that power um, imbalance in the, that's inherent in the structure, right? Because if you have, you know, a senior leader who thinks they have to have all the answers, then they wind up inadvertently or not um, micromanaging others. And they wind, you know, and it, and it turns into fostering instead of a collaborative culture, a, a fearful culture and a, you know, and a yes culture. And, you know, there's no collaboration because, you know, this leader thinks they have to have all the answers. So then they tell everybody else how things are supposed to go instead of, well, wait a second. No, as a leader, you don't need to have all the answers. That's why you have a team. That's why you hired people with certain knowledge, skills, and experience so you could rely on your team and turn to them for the answers. Um, but I've seen so many times, you know, just, just that, um, that power of position, you know, because they're the senior leader and combined with that misconception, it just throws everything off the rails and, and it, it stunts collaboration. Yeah, I would add a few things to that. Um, I think the not, what, what you said, Nicole, not, or feeling like they have to have all of the answers really resonates, but I think it can be even deeper than that. Um, you know, sometimes that, that vulnerability piece, um, doesn't come naturally or they view it as weakness. And I have seen people almost hide difficult news because um, they don't want to admit that they might not know, or they don't want to be seen as a leader in how they define that. And that actually creates so much risk um, on a team. I think the other piece with that, with positional power, um, and I don't know if we'll get into this a little bit later, but Anessa, you kind of mentioned it with the self-awareness, but I also think understanding your privilege in the role that you have and not only the role, but any other privilege that you might bring and how that can um, be intimidating to others and potentially shut other ideas down um, or just... I just think there's a lot of responsibility with that, that some people take for granted. 
um, or don't really understand the the impact of kind of their their wake and their privilege. Um, the third thing I would kind of say with that wake piece is like the emotional wake of people. Um, sometimes the higher you get, or not sometimes, I feel like oftentimes the higher you get, the less feedback you get. And so it can become this cycle of you have all this positional power and you have this privilege and you also feel like you have to know everything <laughs> and then you're not getting feedback right. And so that can create a really challenging situation when it comes to collaboration and understanding the impact of your power on others. Absolutely. And I would say, you know, seeing when collaboration goes wrong, right, is when, um, oh, gosh, <laughs> we we kind of <laughs> mentioned this a little bit, right? We're like, the setup is important. And mm -hmm. I think that where a lot of leaders go, and I've been, you know, on this, on the executive team, where I've been like, we're not doing this this way, right? Is there like, oh, well, we, we need to get everybody in a room. We need to get everybody in a room and we need to brainstorm. And they think that's collaboration. And it's like, OK, but first <laughs> we need to set some ground rules. We need to set some trust rules. We need to put a lot of things in place before we get to that point. Right. Before we get to that spot. And by the way, brainstorming isn't, you know, isn't always the best way for people to bring ideas. Maybe it's brainstorming writing. Maybe it's separately processing and coming back, right? There's a lot of ways to come at it. And Taylor, to your piece too, a lot of leaders tend to say, let's collaborate. And then they'll stand at the end of the table and, you know, completely just take over every idea that they have because they want to tell everyone their idea. And it's like, that's not what we're here for. And that, and that privilege, if you're the highest ranking person in the room, who probably also has some of the most privilege in the room, you probably mm -hmm. should be the quietest. And also you probably should say the least, right? But creating that space where everyone else in that room feels okay to say whatever they feel like they want to say. But that takes a lot to get there. And it's not immediate and it's not we're going to do this next week. It is a, sometimes it's a long game of showcasing to the employees that are going to be in that room collaborating, how you first show up for them so that they can show up for themselves and then they can show up for your organization. Mm -hmm. And so I think it has to be in that order, right? You've got to show them first before you ask them to show up for you. And that piece is really hard for impatient leaders to do. And most leaders got to where they are by being able to make decisions in the moment. So most of them are impatient, right? So like, <laughs> it's kind of like this cycle, this vicious cycle that we have with leaders. And not every leader is that way, but there are a lot that way. Um, so for me, there's a lot that can go wrong if it's not set up properly, right? So um, back to you know your point, Taylor, just around getting the right person, getting the right things in place, um, but it can definitely, if you do not have all of the elements in place in a thoughtful way and you, you know, you stand it up with sticks instead of standing it up with bricks, right? It can easily fall and you've got to make sure that each brick is in place thoughtfully and in the right order and in the right way. I think that's such a good point. If I can add one more thing, what you said made me think of like people's intent as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said like how you set it up and it makes me think of this experience I had. Um, I worked with someone in and I always would say, are we brainstorming, collaborating, or are you trying to convince me yeah. that you want to do it? Yes. Um, and, it and, and I think that all came down to the setup and the intent. And people are smart. They're intuitive. They know they can read into the intent, right? So I think that's so important it, when you think about okay, do we want, and Nicole, how you relabeled it, like true collaboration is is very different than, um, and even your point about brainstorming, different ways to do that. I think that comes all down to the, the setup and the foundation as well. I think of this example, this is like one of my favorite examples for my career, is I had a leader call me on the phone once and they're like, hey, I have this idea. Like, I just want to hear what you think about it. They shared the idea with me. They're like, what do you think? And I'm like, I hate that idea. 
And I did. I hated the idea. It was a really bad idea. <laughs> and they said to me, they were like, I haven't had someone tell me they didn't like my idea in years. And I mean, even the most brilliant people have bad ideas. So I think for me, it's this like, people are, even if you feel like people are being honest with you, probably not because no one has only amazing ideas for years on end. So it's just, it's such an interesting, it's just, again, this is why I'm always talking about positional power because it's so fascinating to me. Um, so on that note, how can managers and leaders work to better understand their own positional power and how it impacts their teams and the workplace? So the first thing I was going to say that you said, Stephanie, that made me think of it is truth tellers. Um, when I would coach, when I was in a business partner role and I would coach leaders, I would always ask them, who is your truth teller? for your team, kind of what you said, Stephanie, you've always been a great truth teller, but that can't always be your HR partner, your people and culture team. You have to find it in other ways, or I'm sure Nicole, as a lawyer, you can't always just go to, to someone to know the right thing to do. And I've challenged leaders to have their own truth tellers as well as be a truth teller. If you're working for a leader who you see struggling, lean into that. And that does take courage and that takes trust. But I guarantee you, if you are that person and you ask for someone to be that person, that goes so far with building trust and creating open dialogue and from collaboration, because it shows people you're willing to be vulnerable. It shows people you're willing to accept and give feedback and that you want to bring in different perspectives. And I think those are all very foundational component components to true collaboration. So that would be my kind of first starting point around that. And I, I'm going to piggyback on that because I, I feel like this is the place to jump in and say it's so important to align the words and the actions. Because how many times have we seen leaders that say, I want your feedback. I want you to tell me, you know, honestly what you think. And then unfortunately, when somebody does, they get slammed in some way. And so, you know, it's, it's really, I think we have to back it up a little bit. And it, it starts with the individual leaders that they have to do some internal work, as we like to say in the professional and the you know development space, they really have to get comfortable with having a learner's mind, a beginner's mind, an open mind, and get comfortable with that vulnerability, like you were saying, that you know it's okay for them to not have all the answers. It's okay for them to be imperfect humans like we all are and to know that you know there are going to be for example some people with higher eq emotional intelligence than they have a lot of times you know leaders aren't necessary even though leaders should have like in an ideal world <laughs> leaders would have the most emotional intelligence many times they have the least and, you know, because that's just not what got them. Emotional intelligence is not what got them to their leadership position. But then when you are a leader, that is the growth edge. That's where leaders really need to realize, oh, I'm a beginner again. There's there's this whole other skill set to learn, you know, because what got me here isn't going to get me to that place of being a great leader. Need new skills. Always learning. Um, so that's um, that I just I just wanted to bring that into the conversation because there's always a lot of lip service and it's important that, you know, we address the elephant in the room, which is <clears throat> you can say all, you can invite feedback. You can say you're OK with it until the cows come home. But if you're really not comfortable, if you're really not able to take and do something constructive with that feedback it's it's suddenly a traumatic work environment not a tra trauma informed workplace yes i would say too how do how do we kind of get 
work on this positional power, right? Stephanie, which is your question around just how do we get better at understanding our positional power? And for me, I often think that those with the most privilege often have the most work to do. And so with that in mind, when I'm working with leaders that have a lot of privilege, it's trying to shift the mindset away from default, right? Because they've always worked in an environment where whiteness was the default, maleness was the default, being an American was the default, right? So getting away from the default, recognizing what the default is and that that is the default, which therein lies the privilege, right? And so for me, it really is understanding to Nicole's point, getting really in that mindset of learning and open to feedback. Because as the default person who has the most privilege, what I often say is you've got the most work to do, right? And so it's kind of like they probably think in opposite, right? They probably think the opposite. I got here, so I have the least amount of work to do. I don't, I might need to learn a few things that I don't need to learn a lot, right? No, you actually probably need to learn the most. And so for me, it's really understanding that positional power, digging deep, doing internal work, but then realizing that while you might be seen as a leader in our society, in America, in the world, wherever we are, mo a lot of it was because of that default. And that's also why you need to do the most work. And so I think it's almost... Um, unwinding that societal knot to say, why do we think that? Why do I feel this way? Why do I think about things in this way? How can I open up my world, my mind, my thoughts to all of these other things that are not default? Why am I defaulting to that, right? Like all of those pieces. So um, understanding that positional power for me is understanding the privilege, understanding the default, and doing, being committed to do that work on yourself. Oof, I love that. These are all fantastic, fantastic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna nerd out again. Do you know, <laughs> HR love nerd it. out. Love um, it. So we talked about structures and systems at the beginning of our conversation. So how can organizational design or structure contribute to power imbalances and issues with effective collaboration? Oh, org structure. This, I'll take this first. Let's so, this <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so fun, right? Org structure is always a fun thing. Oh gosh. Okay. So first of all, I always hug, oh, I always like to say, you should only have structure if it's necessary, right? And I think a lot of people put it in place because that's the way you've always done it, right? Mm -hmm. Which again, then let's rethink that, right? Um, organizational structure to me is much like, and I'm <laughs> this is gonna, it might be a reach, but colonialism a little bit, right? Like it exists because it works for mm -hmm. a certain demographic. Org structure exists because it works for a certain demographic, more so than it works for anyone else. And so if you ask, you know, a hundred white men about org design, they're probably gonna like it. If you ask a hundred non-white, non, you know, non-binary friends, women and men, whether they like org design, I'm probably, you're not going to get like a, yes, we have to have it in a lot of situations because why, right? Org design gives most leaders a platform to feel more special on. And so for me, you know, like I said, it might be a little bit of a reach to like liken it to colonialism, like, you know, colonization, but I will say like, we're not so far off. It's just a different structure in a different place, but it's set up in the same way for the same means. And so a lot of times, do you have to have someone to support staff in your organization, employees in your organization, people, humans in your organization? Yes. But that doesn't mean it has to be that manager. It doesn't mean that it can't be an HR person or friends mm -hmm. or 
colleagues within an organization. And so sometimes I think that organizational structure exists because it further helps a certain demographic. Um, I have been some of the best orgs that I've been a part of and helped consult and be a leader for have had very little org structure. And so I've seen the um, the reason to go away from an organizational structure. And I haven't yet. And again, this is just my own experience. I have not yet seen a place that has a very rigid hierarchical, <laughs> it's this very hard word to say, hierarchical, right? <laughs> uh, organizational structure that also has true collaboration. So I will piggyback off of that because my, you know, what I've seen, my experience is that with the structure comes assumptions. Mm -hmm assumptions about how much power this person has versus another person, assumptions about what this person can do versus other people can do. And that of course stunts collaboration because then people are being put in a box, right? And the walls go up. And um, what, what I've seen is that there is, I've, I've seen it work where even though the titles exist and the structure exists, when there is a culture of open door policy, of skip level communication, right? Where it's not this chain of communication where, oh, only the VP can speak to the C-suite right. and only, right? Like that's, that's when it's, when the culture is such that, you know, everyone must fall in line, then yes, the structure absolutely <laughs> gets in the way of collaboration. But what I, I have seen very structured, um, at least on paper, right? Like there's a structure on paper. I've been in organizations that are on paper, very structured, and they were that way so that there was a clear career path for folks. And the culture was such, I mean, it was very clear in communication, in behavior, that regardless of your title, regardless of your tenure, you have access to everybody. Everybody works together with everybody else. And I think that cultural element is so, I mean, you can call it part of the structure, um, it can be part of the structure to have a very strong culture of open door policy. And I think that that's really important um, to prevent any kind of structure getting in the way of collaboration. Yeah, I think those are both fascinating, <laughs> very fascinating points. I think. I tend to agree with you, Nicole, around the culture piece. And maybe that's just because I've generally worked in large organizations that do have a pretty robust structure. But I do think culture pay, plays a part into that. Do you have a culture of empowerment? How are you driving accountability? Um, how are you leading teams? But then that gets into kind of also how is the culture rewarded? So in that structure where there's hierarchy, um, is it, do you have recognition and rewards and compensation kind of tied to control? Uh, or is it more of a collaborative team first environment? Because ultimately you can have a culture, but, and we could probably debate this for hours, but how you're rewarding and driving accountability is really going to actually shape the behavior. So I think it can be both, right? I, I depending on the organization, you I think structure can help. Um, but it if it's not done the right way and the culture isn't there to support it, then it can really hinder that collaboration. Um so it's probably very situational, but I I love these these ideas. The colonialism piece, like I think Stephanie and I both were like, okay. <laughs> We need an extra hour to, to do this, but it is, it's fascinating, yeah. um, especially when you see people who come from different organizations. I've kind of always been a thought challenger, so I've always felt like if I have an idea or question, I'm going to ask it, but you see people who 
from their own trauma or past experiences will not. Yeah, um, or culture, right? There's culture. cultures. You know, yeah. like, we don't do that, right? We don't do that. Mm -hmm. And, and so that can really impact your experience as an employee, um, and experience as a manager leading teams. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot to unpack there. I think. Yeah. Colonial, a reference to colonialism was not on my bingo card for this panel, but I freaking love it. I told you, if you're not following Anessa, she has the hottest takes. You've got to follow her. I am obsessed. I know, like we have to have a whole nother conversation about this. Um, absolutely. Well, you know, we've we've already talked about so much and I can't believe our time is almost at an end. And so what I always like to wrap up um, the conversation with is, you know, for folks who want to learn more about collaboration, about positional power, about organizational structures, you know, what book, media, podcast, article would you recommend? Nicole, plug your book. Um, I would love to hear from each of you, you know, what you would re recommend to our listeners. So I will plug my book um, <laughs> because it, it, it really, the the premise of the book is how do you really foster effective teamwork? You know, how do you engage your employees to get, to have them bring their best selves to work and get the best results? And so there are so many practical, I'm just, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm known as a very practical bottom line, let's, you know, do what works person. And that that's reflected in this book. There are practical tips and tools. Um, there are even scripts for, you know, leaders and managers to show empathy and mm -hmm. then live, you know, develop empathy within themselves. Um, and so, you know, like I, there's even scripts <laughs> um, um, and, you know, and there's there's a chapter um, that address like each chapter addresses another element of what fosters good teamwork and collaboration. And so there's, you know, a chapter that's spo that's specifically on um, diversity and inclusion. There is a chapter de devoted to. Um, you know, and this was written before COVID, um, but it's devoted to remote work um, and flexible, you know, how flexible work um, structures contribute to collaboration. So anyway, Enhance Employee Engagement, Future Proof Company Strategies is the name of the book. And then a second resource I want to recommend is Simon Sinek's uh, podcast, A Bit of Optimism. He's so good. I, I just, I think he's really good at, um, at the soft skills for leaders. And there's so much in that podcast to help leaders develop the skills that we've been talking about in this conversation. I'll go next. So, okay. So I have a few. Um, <laughs> All right, let me go. Let me go podcasts first, then I'll go books. So podcast, um, podcast. If you do not follow, this is mostly for positional power and also just understanding a lot of what we talked about today and privilege work and leader work and internal work. Roundtable talk um, with Mita Malik and uh, D Marshall is amazing. Um, also, uh, I the I Hate It Here podcast by my very good friend, Hiva Youssef, which was on, she was also on one of these panels, uh, because it it gets real with what, you know, what we're all experiencing as HR people, talent leaders, but also with other leaders as well. Um, so those two podcasts are always in my rotation and to help our internal work as well and just understanding what that is. I really love We Can Do Hard Things. Um, as well, right? I uh, had a friend just send me one about Oprah recently that was on about her Maui fund and how she did not, she got, kind of got vitriol for it. And that was an interesting one to listen to. Books. Okay. So positional power. Uh, my friend, John Graham's amazing book, Plantation Theory. If you have not yet read it, it is about how the corporate space is just another plantation. And it is phenomenal. And you will read it in about a day. Um, it's amazing. So if you are a, uh, a white leader and you do not understand your positional power in corporate America, it is uh, an amazing read. Um, 
I also love I'm Not Yelling by Elizabeth Leva. Again, if you're a white leader and you need to understand a different perspective, you should read that. Um, white Women by Sarah Rao and Regina Jackson. Again, if you are a white woman, please read that. If you are a white woman and not a leader, just a white woman, please read it. Uh, <laughs> um, and then I will end with a shameless plug for my own book coming out in February 2024 called The Revolution of Work. Um, right now, the, the subtitle is uh, Fuck the Patriarchy in the Workplace It Built. So that gives you an idea of what it's about but it is around uh, why the workplace was built, how it was built, all the issues with the workplace that we all see um, and how it is most workplaces are not trauma-informed workplaces and what we can do to make it better. So there is there are positional power elements in that book as well. So that's a long list, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And I can't wait for your book, Anessa. I'm so excited. Yes. Well, my book list just got a lot longer okay. <laughs> from all your recommendations, but I also too had, we can do hard things, um, as a podcast recommendation. I think when we talk about collaboration, a lot of what we talked about with leaders is understanding, um, your own privilege, your own power, your getting vulnerable, um, understanding your own emotional wake. And it definitely has a plethora of episodes um, that deal with that. I don't know if Nessa, you listened to the, a recent one and it said, what kind of liar are you? And oh, I no, I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> I mean, it kind of blows your mind up that um, we all say like, no one lies, you don't lie, but then you're lying. Everyone lies. There's different levels to it. And it's very fascinating. I think even when you think about collaboration and and setting boundaries and is setting boundaries line. And it, it really breaks it down. They do an amazing job. So definitely second that one. I'm sure you saw me react to that recommendation. Um, my most recent read, I'm, I'm about, I'm almost done, is um, Getting Along, How to Work with Difficult People by Amy Gallo. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really fascinating read when you understand um, just how people show up differently in work. Um and when you think about building relationships and um, your own privilege and and how that shows up in conflict and collaboration, because I think, and we didn't dive into it a lot, I'm sure Stephanie will have another lovely topic on it, but with collaboration, there can be conflict mm -hmm. and how to manage that and understanding yourself first. I think, Nicole, you brought up a really valid point around you need to understand how you are as a leader. Um, in order to even be open to truth tellers giving you um, feedback. So it really dives into that. I really enjoyed um, reading that. And she has a lot of articles on um, HBR. Those are my my two um, ones that I wanted to, to highlight. But very excited to check out your recommendations and both of your books as well. So many great recommendations. I don't need more books to buy, <laughs> as you can see. We're not telling my husband, but yes, I've added several books to my reading list for sure. Um, thank you all so much. This has been an amazing conversation. I think, I mean, we could absolutely have a part two to this. Um, what a phenomenal discussion. Thank you all for your time and your insights. Thank you everyone who joined and listened in, whether you're listening live or checking out the recording and make sure to listen in for our next panel discussion, which will be about another fascinating principle of trauma informed workplaces, empowerment. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.